that's where we want to get to. The ability to feel comfortable in this environment that has trained us to be uncomfortable. We're no longer going to be comfortable with objectification. We're no longer going to be comfortable and cool and calm with hating our bodies. This is the revolution we need. From To Be Magnetic, this is The Expanded Podcast with your host, Lacey Phillips. As the leading destination for neural manifestation, we dispel the woo-woo in order to help you create real, tangible results based on neuroplasticity, psychology, epigenetics, and energetics. Our goal is to normalize the practice of manifestation and empower you to get into the driver's seat of your life in order to manifest the experiences, relationships, and things that most align with your authenticity. Part of our manifestation process entails expanding past your limiting subconscious beliefs. Therefore, by tuning into this podcast with interviews from experts, thought leaders, spiritual teachers, scientists, and those with neural manifestation success stories, you're starting the process of expanding your subconscious in order to see to believe that anything you desire is possible. And by pressing play, the process begins. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to another episode of Expanded. Jessica here. I am so excited to share this episode today on body image resilience with two incredible experts. And I'm also really excited to share with you a new deep imagining that we released within the pathway called the body image DI. So this deep imagining really helps you when you're having judgment against your body, shame against your body, feeling uncomfortable in your body, playing the comparison game with people outside of you, and really needing to drop down into your authentic essence and what it feels like to feel confident and at home and safe in your body despite your shape, size, color, ability, any and all of the above. And one other note I want to make on this is anyone who has struggled with body image knows that it is a multifaceted process in order to help heal. So we highly recommend utilizing a tool like this alongside a therapist, a coach, a nutritionist, a dietitian, someone that's really going to help integrate a more intuitive practice around your body and eating and anywhere you might be struggling as well. Our guest today, actually have some incredible tools on this that I've utilized definitely with their book. So this is just another tool on the path to integrating to a more authentic feeling within your body. This is a topic that I have struggled with pretty much my entire life. I have definitely felt over the past year that I'm in the best place I've ever been with it. And yet there is more unblocking and more work to be done within it. There are still triggers and tests that come up for me that I wanted to help create a body image GI since it was a subject that was so near and dear to my heart. And it really kind of highlights this other element of manifestation that we don't really talk on too much, which is our major manifestations versus our mini manifestations. And what are the energetics between the two? Our major manifestations are the ones that manifesting an apartment or a new partner or a new dream career. And there's lots of elements to it. And it really involves a deep unblocking, expanding, and passing tests and really helping to change our neural architecture so we can show up differently. Whereas the mini manifestations are kind of one-off things that you may feel unblocked in, you may feel expanded in, you may not even really have to pass tests or triggers with it. You could, but it won't be nearly as intense as it is with a major manifestation. But the mini ones are more building our trust muscle to remind us that we are co-creating with the universe. And when they come through, it is laying into that element of surrender. So one thing I like to do when I craft my manifestation list is I take a look at my authentic code pillars and I see what pillar do I not 
I feel like I can lean into more and embody more. And so one of my pillars is success. And success to me means this essence of someone who uses their life lesson in their career path and feels empowered in doing so and vulnerable and able to speak their mind and all of those things. And so one of the things I wanted to put on there was this body image DI. I felt expanded already to do so because I have helped create deep imaginings in the past. I felt unblocked to do so because I have done so much work around body image and I didn't feel like I was facing a lot of tests. It felt like everything was just kind of aligning. This is a really good example of putting a manifestation on the list that is really enforcing your trust muscle. When I wrote it down, I knew for a fact it would be created. But the reason I wrote it down was to say, I surrender to the timing of this manifestation coming through. I trust that I'm going to put it here as a reminder to the universe that I want this to actualize. And I'm also letting go of the timeline of it coming out. So had that manifestation come out in November, I'm sure it would have been extremely helpful. But it's really cool how the timing of everything works because now that it has come out in June, right before it is the summer in the States here, it's a really triggering time around body image for a lot of people. And after talking to friends and coworkers and people within my community, we're coming back out of quarantine. People are going to beaches and out in shorts and all of these things that are really triggering for body image anyways. So it seems like having that trust muscle of this DI will come out when it needs to, really aligned with everyone else's highest good as well. At least that's how I perceive it. So I just wanted to share that sort of lesson on the major verse mini and how helpful they can be, even if you feel like you've already manifested it and you already know it can come through. And you can find that body image DI in the show notes or within your pathway in the daily practice. So today's guest, I am so excited to have on. We have Lindsay and Lexi Kite, PhD. They are identical twins and experts of the study of body image and the harmful effects of objectification. They're co-directors of the nonprofit Beauty Redefined and More Than a Body. Lexi and Lindsay teach people how to develop body image resilience through their unique research-backed framework. They recently came out with a book entitled More Than a Body. And Lindsay has even given a TED Talk on the subject. They've really been studying this for quite some time. And one of the really interesting things that they have found is while body positivity is amazing and incredible and and moving things in the right direction, within that framework, we are still objectifying our bodies to be something of value and worth and importance and to define us by. And when we can start to see ourselves as more than just a body, more than just something to be objectified start using our body as they coin the term an instrument not an ornament that's where we can really have this resilience and this bounce back against an industry and a society that has so much pressure on what our bodies should and should not look like so I know this is so eye-opening for myself this is a topic I'm so passionate about when I look around body image issues is truly something that has impacted every single person in my life. I can't wait to find more education and resource and tools in order to help support us and make us feel more empowered and at home within our bodies. I also want to give a trigger warning because there is a bit of conversation that's brought up around eating disorders. So I want to be mindful for anyone who might be in a very difficult space with any of those things, take in what feels comfortable and it feels too heavy or feels like too much right now, then feel free to skip over or tune out. And yeah, we are just so excited to have Lindsay and Lexi on and really open up the discussion on how we can be more empowered in the vessels that we are using while on this earth. And now a word from our partners. So I've shared this before, but I became sober curious before the term sober curious was a thing. Uh, In fact, I remember my very last drink was at Chateau Marmont, listening to the piano at Christmas, having a really fine scotch. 
I used to be a cocktail server for many years, and the last two were at the Thirsty Crow in Silver Lake, so I had wonderful education and nice scotches and whiskeys uh, and more. And especially around the holidays or the evenings after meals, or (laughs) when I'm in a really beautiful, warm place, I start to crave either digestives, a wonderful rosé, or a nightcap, like a beautiful scotch. And so for me personally, I thought that that was kind of all done with when I stopped drinking. Again, I did it for health reasons. It wasn't so much about not drinking, but that my body couldn't really withstand it anymore. And it wasn't until my birthday of last year that I discovered Kin Euphorics. I bought a bottle of it and I had my friend create a mocktail for my birthday party, who was a bartender for many years. And because it was a rainy day and we had a fire going, it was the perfect alternative to that fine scotch I would have during the holidays or in the evenings. Everybody loved it and enjoyed it. And so what I love about Kin is they have a few different products, one of which is called Dream Light. And it, like all of their products, has adaptogens, nootropics, and botanics. And this one in particular is the perfect digestif or nightcap because it has reishi mushroom, which taps into consciousness, calming, it reduces cortisol, while the passion flower and it relieves restlessness. And if you consume it consecutively, it's been shown to support sleep cycles. And the nootropics in it is 0.25 milligrams of melatonin, which signals the brain to ease into a state of rest without knocking us out. It also has the precursor to GABA, which produces ease to the mind. Tryptophan supports serotonin levels to relax the body. Think turkey after Thanksgiving. And then this is my favorite part of all, which plays into holidays and evenings especially, is the botanics in it are oak, clove, ginger, and cinnamon, which are the perfect digestion supports and gives that really earthy, beautiful taste that you could get with a scotch. So if you're somebody who's sober curious, you're sober, or you're just looking for a wonderful nightcap that mimics having a drink without any of the side effects, and in fact has health benefits and calm, rest, relaxation support, Kin's Dream Light is your perfect product to turn to. Go ahead and use the code MAGNETIC15, all caps, that's M-A-G-N-E-T-I-C-15, to receive 15% off your purchase. Again, that's MAGNETIC, all caps, 15, to receive 15% off your purchase. When we first decided to take on partnerships in order to take this podcast to the next level for you, it was an absolute no-brainer to partner up with Blue Blocks. You've heard me talk about them for, I think, about a year and a half to two years at this point. Just like you, I first discovered them listening to a podcast. And as a listener, I used the code of the podcast to buy my very first pair, which was a nighttime pair with the red lenses. And what hooked me about that specific episode is it goes so in depth, just like the two episodes we have with founder Andy Mant, into why blue light is so hormonally disrupting, it disrupts our sleep patterns, our natural circadian rhythms. And then I became a huge expert on light pollution. And I've gone on now to buy multiple of their products with my own money. The very favorite that I use every single evening. I also take it with me every place I travel so that I can use it on the airplane and I can use it for jet lag, as well as using it for DIs during the day and the evenings, is the sleep mask. Now, before this, I used many sleep masks because I was doing the DIs with them. However, once they released this product, I've never looked back. And I own three of them, again, that I've bought with my own money. I have one at the Forest House. I have one that's always packed and ready for travel. And I have one in Topanga. What's so miraculous about these is that they've developed them so that they're kind of like goggles, meaning that when they're over your eyes, they're not smashing your eyes. So they're not creating wrinkles. They're also not creating your eyelashes just to smash and get into your eyes, things that I've experienced with other eye masks. So it's kind of like a goggle in the sense that you can actually open your eyes when you're wearing them and you can move your eyes around. But here's the kicker, and it's totally backed by science, they 100% block out light. So if you've been looking for an eye mask to do DIs with, to travel with, or like me, if you still are in the country and receive light pollution at night, which I do in Topanga coming in through the valley, you will want to pick these up. 
if anybody's ever struggled with any type of fertility or hormonal disruption like I have, you will want to listen to the two episodes linked below that I have with the founder, Andy Mant, where he goes deep into the science of how blue light disrupts our circadian rhythm, our hormones, our sleep, and our happiness. So use the code at checkout, all caps, MAGNETIC, M-A-G-N-E-T-I-C, to receive 15% off your purchase. All right, on to the episode. I am so excited to have on today Lexi and Lindsay Kite from Beauty Redefined and co-authors of the book More Than a Body. I have been looking at your guys' Instagram for so long and I've been on my own sort of body resilience journey for a long time. We usually kick off with your sun, moon, and rising. So let's start there because I was just about to jump into questions right about the work. (laughs) But do you guys happen to know your sun, moon, and rising signs? We only know our sun sign, which is Virgo. Oh, how cool. Oh, my rising. And now I can't remember what it is, to be honest. Yeah, me too. But we have the same ones. Can you tell us? (laughs) Ooh, yes, I definitely can. Let's see. All right. So we have sun in Virgo, moon in Cancer. Oh, that's wonderful. (laughs) And then your ascendant is in Virgo. Mm. Very cool. So Virgo is like very grounded, creative, practical, very go-getter. And then the Cancer is, you know, more on the emotional side, strong empathy, actually really strong, like empath and intuitive. So that's really cool. Do you guys feel like that resonates? Yeah, Yeah. absolutely. (laughs) So fun. Okay, so tell us a little bit about your cultural background and upbringing and what sort of how that informed who you guys are and really all of the work that you do today. Yeah, I'll jump in on that one. So as you know, we're identical twins. So we grew up in Idaho Falls, Idaho, and really regular middle class white girl growing up life. And so one thing that's interesting about us being identical twins is that, as you probably know, twins are constantly getting compared. So whenever anyone met us for the first time or even hadn't seen us for a few days or weeks or months, they would come up to us and just do a full body and face scan up and down to try to figure out which one was which and which differences did they remember. And they'd call out those things that they perceived to be different between us that would help them remember next time. So we're just constantly getting really scanned and compared. And that created a lot of competition between us. We grew up our whole lives just being super competitive in every aspect, you know, who was smarter, prettier, more popular, whatever. And that created kind of a lot of tension between us until we decided to join forces later in life with similar interests and passions, which is exactly what we're doing right now. But we also grew up in a fairly conservative environment. And so that I think also created some tension in us when we went to college and started to learn a bit more about feminism and about the ways that women sometimes weren't as represented and their voices weren't quite as heard and uplifted as so many men's voices tend to be in a more conservative environment and in religious environments. And so that created this kind of interest in us to understand more about that and why that resonated so much and how we could help amplify women's voices and get women closer to reaching their full potential and happiness and all of that. And that's a lot of what we do through our work. Yeah, I feel like one thing that has resonated so much with us is that women in conservative cultures, in in most cultures, but definitely in conservative cultures, when they aren't given institutional power in the ways that men are, they seek that power oftentimes through their bodies, like whether it's through like producing children (laughs) or through their beauty, their beauty and their bodies, that becomes this currency for them. And in a world where, you know, we are so committed to making sure that all people are more than bodies, all people are, you know, more than just pretty decorations or people whose bodies are just projects to be constantly fixed and decorative. We are really hoping to help people see their power, women's power and influence and potential outside of the way their bodies appear. It's such, such important work and so many layers and generations of programming that's sort of attached to it and hunkered into the society. 
How were you able to join forces? I'm always so curious about that, that stage. Was it a conversation? Was it both sort of your own enlightenment or your own sort of awakening or interest? Did you wind up going to the same school and studying the same topics? Yeah, we wrote about this a bit in our book. Like our book was especially scary because, you know, we have PhDs. We come at this work as experts in the work of body image and our particular field is body image resilience. But we're also just 35-year-old women growing up in a really sexist and objectifying culture. You know, we have bodies. We are not immune from body shame. And the thing that united us was when we were 18, we were sitting in a classroom our freshman year of college. We were trying not to be such twins. We were both studying journalism, but we at least wanted to take separate sections of the same class so we wouldn't be together in the same classroom. So I remember going to this one class. It was the first day of this class in media literacy, like the ability to read and understand and comprehend why media messages are framed the way they are. Why are women represented the way they are and usually only fitting very unreal ideals? And how does that impact people? I remember sitting in that classroom that first day. It was like a spiritual experience. I got goosebumps. My heart pounded. I felt the truth of what we were learning. I realized how I'd been impacted. I went home to our shared dorm room with Lindsay. I told her about that class and she said, shut up. I had the exact same experience. I had that class at two or whenever she had it. Wow. Yeah, it was an unquestioned shared enlightenment. It was unexpected, but it it just became something that we couldn't deny that we both felt so passionately about. And so that passion fed into us continuing in that program with journalism and women's studies and speech, but then going and getting our master's degrees and PhDs together and studying much more in depth about the health promotion aspect and the psychology behind it and how we can help women to not only feel better about their bodies, but get out of thinking of their bodies as something to be viewed as opposed to something to be lived within. And that has framed our work ever since from the nonprofit Beauty Redefined to our book, More Than a Body, and everything we've done online for the last, oh, 12 years. I, that's what I think is so incredible about the work that you guys do, because there are a lot of people trying to move the needle in terms of beauty definition and body positivity and all of these things. And for me personally, it always felt like, okay, yeah, like that feels good, but like something just doesn't add up or my brain's not really taking it in. Like the idea, you know, you guys write about it in the book, but like, you know, all bikini or all bodies are bikini bodies. And I'm like, okay, yeah, like I like the theory of that. I like the idea of that. All bodies are beautiful. I like the idea of that. But why don't I feel it on like a subconscious level? Like, why is this truth so hard to accept? And then when I saw the reframe from you guys of, well, sometimes it doesn't feel like that and that's okay. Let's stop focusing on the body. Let's look at all the other things and all the other value that we bring into this world. I think that was such like a, whoa, this feels aligned. Oh, thank you. Yes. Our definition of positive body image, like we start out the book with it. We've made the rounds on the internet many times with this definition, and it really resonates with people. And that's the positive body image isn't believing your body looks good. It's believing your body is good, regardless of how it looks, because none of us have, you know, perfect instruments. Our bodies don't always work the way we want them to. But what we found and what we've tried to gently nudge people toward, and we think it's been working, is that body positivity is wonderful. Being able to see diverse representations of bodies on the internet is revolutionary because mainstream media barely gives us anything when it comes to seeing women that look like people we see in real life and representing a variety of people and bodies. But it only gets you so far. Our bodies are not objects to be looked at. So healing our body image, like our perception and our feelings about our bodies, it can't be about changing how we view our bodies. It's changing how we value our bodies. And that is something that is so deeply important for people to understand. You can't feel hot enough to always feel hot. The point to our work is to try to liberate people from seeing our bodies as these prisons that we just have to decorate and adorn. And we feel like we're getting somewhere. Yeah, that resonates so deeply because I just, the looping thought that was in my brain for so long going through this journey was, you know, well, if I just get down to this 
size, you know, this arbitrary size, then I'll be there forever and I won't ever have to think about my body again. And I can go about my life and just enjoy and stop obsessing. But until I'm there, I'm not going to feel it. And then maybe you get there, but you don't feel it. Your body is forever changing on a daily basis, monthly basis, weekly basis. I mean, it's forever evolving. And so there's no pinnacle. There is no peak where we're looking to achieve and then we never have to think about it again. That doesn't exist. Yeah, absolutely. We talk about it as sort of a mirage. It's like this oasis that doesn't really exist, but it's put out there by companies, industries, even influencers who want to make it seem like they've really got their lives together and they are happy and fulfilled because they finally got this body problem under control. And what you're describing is exactly true. If your body confidence comes from liking how you look, it's going to rise and fall with every wave that comes along. And in this culture that places so much value on the way women's bodies appear that objectifies us at every possible turn, then it's going to rise and fall a lot. All Every accept, acceptance, rejection, negative comment, even positive comment, good and bad photo, all that kind of stuff is going to shake you and jar you and prevent you from really consistently feeling that positivity and that fulfillment. And so that's why body positivity is not the final step. It's not the ultimate goal. We don't get to this plateau once of, all right, well, now I love my body, check that box. Instead, we focus on this process that we identified in our research called body image resilience. This ability to go through these hard things in this objectifying culture, which we will continue to do, we'll continue to feel that shame. But what we do is equip people with the skills and the strategies to immediately respond to those disruptions, all that shame that comes up in the moment without just coping in all the same negative ways, without the diets and the buying new clothes and the getting cosmetic surgery or the self-harm and the addictive behaviors, all that kind of stuff. Instead, there are so many things that people can do to turn back toward their bodies as their home as opposed to turning against their bodies, looking at them as objects to be fixed and judged. Yes, yes. That brings us right into self-objectification. That was such a revolutionary concept and idea. Sort of define that and explain how that really plays into and creates sort of the warped or distorted body image. Such a good question. Yes. Self-objectification once you know it, you can't unknow it. You can't unsee it. When I was doing my, it was probably my master's research so many years ago, and I learned about self-objectification, this light bulb went off in my head that said, this is how you've lived your life. How are we going to get you out of it and everybody else? So self-objectification is this big word that means this thing that everybody listening is going to relate to. It's this idea that you live and you picture yourself living. Your identity is literally doubled. Most, if not all the time in your life, self-objectification takes place because we grow up in a world that tells us in a million ways that we are our bodies, that our bodies are our power, and we are how we appear. We are bodies first and, and people second. So of course, we grow up monitoring ourselves from the outside. We picture what other people must be thinking and seeing when they look at us. We monitor our bodies according to our worst fears of what we think other people might be thinking we look like. We, you know, walk down the street and instead of thinking about what a beautiful day it is or your to-do list or you need to call your mom because you haven't talked to her in a while, you are looking at the person walking toward you and thinking in your head, I wonder what they think about me. Do they think I look fat? Do I need to adjust my clothes? Oh my gosh, I wish I would have washed my hair. My hair is so greasy. I'm getting zits from this mask, blah, blah, blah. You evaluate yourself according to these unreal ideals. And in our research, that just showed up so strong. We both in our separate dissertation studies, we asked all of the women this baseline question, how do you feel about your body? And almost all of them, more than 80% of them, only describe themselves according to how they appear and the parts especially that they do not like about how they look. That is self-objectification. We're all holding ourselves back from life and research backs that up. When you're self-objectifying, when you're self-conscious of how you look, you don't perform as well on reading comprehension tests, on math tests, physical fitness. You can't get into a flow state when you're working out or drawing or writing or singing because your mind is caught up thinking about how you appear. And this is the root of all of our problems. This is what body positivity cannot fix because continuing to center the appearance of our bodies, whether you like it or hate it, 
doesn't fix self-objectification. It just reinforces it. And then another piece that I thought was so, so powerful was this idea of disruptions. And you have these disruptions and they can lead to three different paths. You guys talked about it a bit in the TED Talk, but go through some of those paths and sort of the breakdowns, because I truly feel every person falls into one of these three paths because people have been exposed to a disruption and their self-objectification about their body. Yeah, they definitely do. This whole process of body image resilience is kind of based around the idea that women tend to have a state of normative discontent about their bodies. So we talk about this in kind of a water metaphor. We start this in the book where we first describe self-objectification as this process of being a little kid and playing on the beach and having no self-consciousness, no fear or awareness of how other people are looking at you or judging your body. But over time, as you learn about the importance of beauty and bodies and all of these influences start to seep into your life, you get pulled out into those waters. We call it the waters of objectification, where it's just normal to be an object. And you watch your body from the outside. And in the state of normative discontent, where we're evaluating and monitoring our bodies for how they look, as opposed to how we feel or what we're doing or any of those things, then we usually feel pretty negatively about ourselves. Because in this environment, it is impossible to live up to these standards. We're aging, we're growing we're having babies, we're losing weight and gaining weight. It's always going to be changing. And so this state of normative discontent is filled with self-objectification, it's filled with shame, and we just kind of adapt to it. It feels normal for most of us. And we even bond over that, those shared experiences of like, oh, I feel so fat today, or I'm having such a terrible hair day. We just cycle with each other in a kind of a vicious cycle of, oh, no, you don't. Have you seen me? And so we help people to recognize how even though it's normal, it's not comfortable. And one of the things that will wake people up from that discomfort that's just so invisible to us is these disruptions. And we consider them waves of body image disruption. A disruption is anything that changes the way you relate to your own body or how you perceive your own body. So it could be little things like a negative comment about your body or someone mentioning something about your weight. It could be an illness, a pregnancy, a miscarriage, a breakup. It could be uh, seeing a photo or a video of yourself that you don't like. Those things stir up that shame to the point where we have to react in some way. And so those three different paths that people take when they react to that, those disruptions that cause the shame, the first one is the worst and it's sinking deeper into shame. Unfortunately, a lot of people will relate to this. They will try to numb or distract themselves from that shame through some pretty disordered and troubling behaviors. Self-harm in particular is huge, especially among young women. Disordered eating is a huge one, and also substance abuse in all of its forms, addictive behaviors, things that might distract us and numb us for a moment, but ultimately leave us feeling worse off overall and about our bodies. We will dislike our bodies even more when we come out of that high or that numb. The second path that people take will be even more familiar. This is something that we all learn to do in this objectifying environment. We cling to that uncomfortable comfort zone and we do that by hiding and fixing our bodies. And there's an endless list of ways that we are told that we can fix our bodies to gain back that confidence, relieve the shame and feel happy. It's in makeup, it's in fashion, it's in dieting. Everything you can think of that wants you to fix or enhance some aspect of your body is really just prolonging that shame, pushing it down the road because it will come back and, and those fixes don't ultimately work to heal your body image. And then the hiding part of it is literally sitting out, opting out of activities, events, situations. We stop participating in class, in sports, in board meetings. We don't go up for leadership positions and opportunities because we don't want to be looked at or we don't think we quite qualify to be looked at. We fear that judgment. And so imagine the ways all of this is holding women back when we face these disruptions and then just cling to these uncomfortable comfort zones that are not serving us in any way, keeping us in this vicious cycle of self-objectification. And then this light at the end of the tunnel is what we call body image resilience. It's taking this third path to rising, pushing off the bottom of the water of the ocean and letting go of that shame by using strategies for resilience, where we can look around and see more in our, in our environment, get really critical of all of the messages about bodies that have shaped the way you're feeling right now, that have caused you to feel this shame, and then get really compassionate toward yourself and toward other people who may have inflicted this pain upon you, whether consciously or unconsciously. 
And then we go to work with actually retraining our brains and the ways we think about our bodies. We have to think of our bodies as instruments instead of ornaments, instruments for our use, our benefit, and not just ornaments to be looked at and judged. And this requires obviously a continuous process, a lifetime of work, but it is so much more achievable and hopeful than staying in that same cycle we've been in, of hiding and fixing and sinking deeper into shame. I think just having the discourse on understanding the different paths and where you can kind of go when you face a disruption, when you face something that's triggering about your body is so helpful because for me, you kind of think you're just like floating along doing these things, not super aware of it. And it almost feels like when you are aware of the paths, you can start to be more conscious of, oh, wow, I'm going down path two right now, or I'm going down this path of fixing and hiding. How can I make a different decision here? How can I make a different choice? Do you feel that people can shift between different like path one, path two, path three, as they sort of heal different parts or kind of maybe bounce around between the three as they're in the process of healing different parts of themselves? Yeah, I think that's built into the model. The model of body image resilience is absolutely based upon the fact that we will continuously feel these disruptions. Like body image resilience doesn't work as just like a one-time thing. This is a lifelong kind of path that you follow. And that means that you will consistently find yourself going back to those behaviors that don't serve you. I'll give you a personal example. This stuff happens all the time, but in my own life, you know, coming out of the pandemic, I didn't really have to wear jeans or go out for like a year, you know, like I have an 18 month old baby. So really it's been like a couple years of no jeans because I was pregnant. It was summer. Then the pandemic hit. I'm not just going to wear jeans for fun. So I was (laughs) trying on old jeans and they were tight. They were tighter than they used to be. And it immediately triggered me to that feeling of, oh my gosh, I need to make a plan. Like I have got to cut down what I'm eating. What is wrong with me? You know, just even as a body image expert, that stuff, it rises up. And yet because of my years of working on body image resilience, the second that shame rose up, I recognized it. I know what that feels like. I know that I don't deserve to live in that shame. I have done nothing to deserve that. That disgusting feeling of your cheeks get red, thinking about what somebody might think when they look at you or if they knew what pant size this was or how much you weighed or saw you in the wrong lighting. You know, we all experience that. And instead I sat with it for a minute and I thought about what my body has gotten me through. Like to really internalize that paradigm shift that my body is an instrument, not an ornament. What does that actually mean? That means that in the last year, this freaking body survived and thrived in a pandemic with a whole lot of privilege. I was able to take the time to work out most days through this pandemic because I was prioritizing my mental health. And getting into that workout flow of doing HIIT workouts and walking and hiking was amazing for my mental health and my physical health. But that didn't show up in in changing my body. I didn't lose weight. If anything, my butt got bigger. (laughs) (laughs) And I was able to reframe that shame and think what a privilege it is that my body works the way it does, that I have been able to work out and live this this really, really incredible life with these legs, these legs that have been with me since the very beginning. And I would not tell little Lexi that she was disgusting or embarrassing because of these same thighs that she grew when she was little. So I cannot treat myself that way now. And instead I went and I did a workout. I did some lunges. I did some squats. I appreciated what I have and I did not make plans to change my body. And that is one little opportunity that I took to rise with resilience. I love that. There's so many pieces of that I want to extrapolate on. So just giving another personal example of these different paths to just showcase to everyone. So I've had a lot of disordered body stuff and at various stages. And when I was much younger, high school and under, I was suffering from eating disorders and sort of in that deep shaming 
space where I was like, okay, this is my sense of control on it. And I have to hurt my body in order to get it to do the things I want it to do. And with a lot of internal work, I was able to heal that and be in recovery from all of that. And then more recent years, I'm like, okay, cool. It's all gone. It's done. But there was still so much shame for the body and there were still so many more layers to chip away at. And so I think I've been operating a lot more in the path too, which is the like, oh, today I'm, you know, a couple pounds up on the scale. I need to not go out and I need to exercise and diet and do all of these things to fix. And now in the past few years, especially through therapy and doing, you know, our work at To Be Magnetic, really understanding, okay, I feel uncomfortable in my body. It makes me want to go and fix everything. How can I still have a healthy physical relationship with myself while also not going down this shame spiral of needing to fix it for validation? And I think that brings up, you know, this other piece, which you mentioned, where so many times people attribute physical fitness with almost like a distorted body image, like physical fitness is used as punishment for not being at the body shape you need to be at or want to be at or whatever it may be. How can we start to reframe physical fitness as something for our mental health? How can people start to look at it and be like, this is not punishment because, you know, just in your example, it wasn't punishment because you had gained weight. It was a celebration that your body got you through and you wanted to keep celebrating it through, you know, physical fitness. Yeah, really good question. That's actually a huge part of my dissertation research is on the ways women perceive and define physical fitness and health for themselves. And what we found overwhelmingly was really similar to what we found with that self-objectification research, that women defined fitness in ways that overwhelmingly described appearance as opposed to ability, stamina, how you feel, internal indicators of health, and all of the other things that really matter in health and fitness. And so the most important thing to do in trying to unravel our feelings of body shame from our desires for physical fitness and the behaviors that we actually engage in to promote that fitness is to completely separate appearance from health and fitness. And it sounds difficult for people because most people can't even imagine what it would be like to measure their own health and fitness in ways that have nothing to do with how they look, how much they weigh, which clothes they fit into, their physical measurements and everything else that is measured from the outside. But that is what is most important. Um, When you talk about seeing that number on a scale and knowing that it went up a couple pounds, so I'm going to adjust my behaviors now to fend off that shame that I feel about that number going up then what you're doing is objectifying your own health. It's turned into a number that is outside of you instead of a feeling, a process, what's actually going on inside this body of yours. And so that is where we we really get to our main mantra that my body is an instrument for my use, not an ornament to be looked at. And that, that presents this whole shift in a worldview where from now on, we are going to evaluate and measure our own health and fitness according to how we feel, what we can do, what we want to experience, what you want to be able to do, as opposed to just what you might look like or how much you weigh. And so that means throwing out the scale, not using that measuring tape, disregarding your BMI, even when the doctor says, oh, you should be in a lower BMI category. What you can know is that the BMI and your weight is actually an extremely ineffective measure of whether you are healthy or fit. It was never intended for individuals. It was intended for large population level diagnostic studies. And yet it's used as a really cheap and easy way for people to supposedly diagnose their own health and fitness. You can get away from that by personalizing your health once again with a focus on what you are doing. So instead of setting a goal like I want to get to this weight or I want to you know, burn this number of calories every day because that is, again, a direct focus on weight and body size. And the goal then is to change your weight and your body size. Instead, we reframe that. So your goal is now, what do I want to be able to do by the end of this month or this year? How do I want to feel when I go on that hike with my family this summer? I want to be able to do X thing or feel X way in this process. Or I simply want to move my body for 
you know, 30 minutes a day in an enjoyable way, something that I actually look forward to listening to an audiobook or a podcast or something like that, because that is you actually using your body. We get ourselves out of this rut of just thinking about how our bodies look and being so fixated on how the world perceives us. And when we use our bodies as instruments in ways that are enjoyable, not in punishing ways, we are able to get back inside our own bodies. We stop self-objectifying. We are able to focus on how we're feeling, what we're doing, and even get into that flow state Lexi mentioned, where you lose that self-consciousness, that self-objectifying feeling of imagining how your body appears, and you're able to get lost in a moment. Your body can help you do that, but you've got to use it in the process. And I think too, you know, like when you're in those flow states, you're able to be more creative, think more, you know, logically, use more of your brain, you're able to move more freely. Like you have all of these things sort of turn on in that's going on if you're able to get in that flow state. And I think knowing the right type of exercise for you at whatever specific time is so important too, because I remember in college, I would do such intense cardio. Like I, there was like a number on those machines that I knew I needed to hit and burn that many calories. Who knew if it was even accurate to begin with, but I was so fixated on that number and sweating so much. I wasn't even cued into what does my body want right now? It doesn't want this exercise every single day, but yet I'm forcing myself here every single day. And it actually wasn't until I started doing like yoga and Pilates, it was so much calmer. I was lightly sweating, but I felt so good and strong in my body because I needed that de-stressing motion. I needed something light. It was the high cardio was too intense. I needed something to calm my brain. And that was actually getting me to a better level of physical fitness than the high intensity was. Yes. Like that's intuitive movement. You're talking about being really intuitive with yourself about how you're moving your body and why you're moving your body. I'm in totally the same boat. Years ago, I used to punish myself with running. That was the thing. That's what every woman is told they need to do in order to stay small. You know, well, we don't want people to live small lives. We want people to live enjoyable, purposeful, liberated lives. So if you're talking about empowering women, what better way to do that than to help them get back in touch with their own bodies, to be able to access that flow state. Oh, it's just such freedom and such exhilaration to get into that flow state, you know? And you can't do that when you're punishing yourself with really unsustainable workout routines. The way to promote health and healthy behaviors is to make something sustainable, And something that's punishing isn't sustainable. You can never keep that up. It's the same with dieting. That's why dieting always results in binging because it is not sustainable. But when we can come back home to ourselves, like prioritize a first person perspective inside our bodies in a world where we've always lived outside of ourselves. We've always lived prioritizing how other people see us and how other people experience and judge us. When we can come back home, there is nothing more freeing. So I'm quickly interrupting this episode to invite you if you're ready to start your manifestation journey, or if anything you've heard in our manifestation episodes has piqued your interest to begin. We have a la carte workshops in everything from the basics bundle, which is what we recommend to everyone who starts. It's the formula that actually teaches you how to manifest, unblocked inner child, and unblocked shadow. We also have a la carte workshops on love and money. But the real gem is the Pathway membership because it encompasses every single workshop we have. It's a year-long membership with full access to the few a la carte offerings we have and exclusive workshops not available anywhere else, such as the daily practice, which is what everybody in the Pathway uses, hopefully at least three times a week to daily in order to truly create the new neural pathways that one needs in order to manifest and houses the library of our deep imaginings, which is our unique hypnosis process that allows you to get into your subconscious and overwrite those old neural pathways, creating the new ones. You can use our special code EXPANDED, all caps, E-X-P-A-N-D-E-D, 
to receive $20 off your first a la carte workshop purchase or $20 off your first month of the pathway. Again, that's all caps, expanded, E-X-P-A-N-D-E-D. Okay, now back to the episode. As you are starting, you know, people listening in, they're starting to recognize some of these maybe behaviors they've been doing. Now they're like, okay, I want to start changing some things, the way I'm relating to myself. If their core friend group is not reflective or conscious of examining their bodies in, you know, more body image resilient way, and they're still stuck in the same patterns where they're self-objectifying, maybe they want to gossip around how little they're going to eat before an event or something that's really harmful to be around. How do you suggest people set up some boundaries around that initial transition phase to, oh my gosh, okay, there's all these things I need to change. How do I tell my friends I can't talk about this stuff anymore? Well, we really feel like the best approach to that starts with vulnerability. It starts with a bit of realness toward people. And it's so funny because we get questions about this constantly. Even people who have been following our work for a long time and and we're always providing tips on really practical situations, how to interact with people, how to make changes and the way you relate to your body and other people's. And yet we still get this question over and over again where people say, my mother-in-law says things to my daughter about her body or she says terrible things about her own body or my friends are constantly talking about dieting and I'm not sure what to do about it. And the answer is so simple and it's right in front of people. And yet it feels difficult to them because the answer is to be honest with people, to tell them what you're working on. And everyone fears offending somebody or alienating people. But when you approach a situation like that with real honesty about why you are making changes, then people will respect that. They may even relate to it and want to join you. That's really best case scenario. And we've seen that happen a lot. But what it really starts with is just very simple facts. If you are feeling like you need to change your relationship with your body, that means you've probably gone through some stuff. You have probably dealt with disordered eating or a lot of shame about your body. Maybe you've coped with that shame in really harmful ways. You feel really distanced from your body, depressed, anxious, all of that kind of stuff. You may have even gone through some traumatic things that have pushed you toward this type of shame and a disordered relationship with food and exercise and everything else. And so if that's true, and this is your motivation for wanting to change how you feel about your body and relate to it, then when possible, tell people that. Start there. You're not going to offend anyone when you say, hey, I just want you to know that I've struggled with disordered eating before, or I'm really working on making sure my daughter knows that she's so much more than a body. And that starts with me and my language and also who she's interacting with and who I'm interacting with. And so I I appreciate that you may be in a different spot than me, but I would really love your help to try to make sure we cut out the body talk and the diet talk around me because I'm trying to embrace my body as an instrument as opposed to looking at it as an ornament. It's hard, but I would really like your help. Can you get on board with that? When you have a conversation like that with somebody who you actually care about and they don't get on board, that's where you start to set those boundaries. That's where you can say, for me, what I need in my life, I'm going to have to have a little distance. You could be real with people about why. You could say, I'm having a difficult time when you're talking about keto and macros all the time and what you've got to drop before you go on vacation and all of that. And maybe that is hurtful, but what it also is, is real and honest. And that gives people an opportunity to really reflect on their own relationship with their body and the choices they're making alone and in front of people. It's really that vulnerability that I think makes a big difference in the way you're able to approach people, extend compassion to yourself and to them. I think that's really key. We recognize all the pressure that exists in our lives, in this environment that values our bodies at the expense of our humanity. And when you approach people with that knowledge and with that level of kindness, I don't think anyone's going to feel that defensiveness. And and if they do, you know where to draw those boundaries. I agree. I feel like when your friends are talking about dieting, when your friends are talking, you know, in that shame spiral of bonding over what parts of their bodies they hate, that's them signaling to you that they're hurting. 
that's nothing more than a signal. Sure, we can bond over this shame and negativity, but it gets us nowhere. That's not actually bonding. That's just dehumanizing and objectifying. That's just separating each other from our real selves. And, you know, we encourage people to use us. Say, I was just listening to this podcast or I've been reading this book more than a body. I think we should read it. Like Lindsay and I have dropped in to like 25 Zoom book clubs just this year, like just in the last few months of people that are reading our book and engaging with our work and trying to figure out how to change not just their own lives, but the lives of everybody in their circles of influence. I think you can use every opportunity of somebody objectifying themselves or somebody you can see is signaling to you that they're they're feeling pretty defined by their body as an opportunity. Like that's another opportunity for resilience to use your power to help them to change the game. Like this happens on the ground floor. This happens when every single one of us decide now we are no longer going to be defined by our bodies. We are humanizing ourselves and everybody else around us. So every time you get a cue from somebody that they are not feeling great, they are feeling confined by or defined by their bodies, take it as an opportunity to show them another way. Tell them what you're learning. Invite them to this new path that will make their lives so much happier. And I really love the approach you're kind of suggesting here too, because I think because there is so much shame on our bodies and there's so much societal pressure out there that a lot of times what I'll see is people will decide, okay, I'm not going to you know, do anything that's harmful or against my body. I'm going to celebrate it and be accepting of it in every way. And then they see someone who's still maybe engaging in harmful behaviors towards their body or they're getting a ton of plastic surgery and then the judgments come out and they're like, oh, well, they're still perpetrating X, Y, Z and there's this shame. And I think that's just as damaging. Everyone is on their own journey. And because we live in a society that is so critical of female bodies, all bodies, but female bodies in particular, that we have to be mindful and understand, hey, if someone feels more comfortable in their skin getting plastic surgery or abiding to this diet or whatever, that's their journey. It's okay. We all just have to give each other support and love no matter where we're at on the spectrum. There's no wrong. It's all an individual journey forward. Yeah. And the great thing about building your own body image resilience and your resistance to those messages that bring up that shame and make you want to cope in ways that don't really serve you is that as you build that, you are no longer an enemy or a competitor with all of the other women in your life. So if they go get cosmetic surgery or Botox or lose a bunch of weight or do other things that you are actively trying to avoid or sacrifices that you're trying to make so you can keep your beauty standard at a normal level for yourself, your family, whoever, then it doesn't matter what anyone else does. And you don't need to judge or think any less of them because you hold in your heart this real sense of compassion, this real recognition of all of the pressure that so many women face and all of the messages that we've been sold about what it's going to take to make people comfortable and confident and happy and desirable. We're all falling for those messages in different ways. And as we actively protect ourselves from them and try to react to that shame in different ways, we give other people space to do the exact same thing. It's not a reflection on me, what this other person chooses to do. It's not putting extra pressure on me and what I need to do with my body. It's not even a statement about what they think of my body if they choose to do something else with theirs or judge theirs in a different way. We become allies in this together. We become so much more kind toward each other to allow each other space to make your own choices because we are more than bodies, because everybody is not just an object to be looked at. And so you value so much more in other people and what they do with their bodies becomes so much less important. I love that. And then you guys mentioned this in the book as well, but I thought this was another really important piece is that there are so many other layers that people are also facing, not only just body image. You know, there's race, ethnicity, gender, sexuality, class, ability, and body size that all play into how someone's experiencing and perceiving their bodies. And so it's also important to be aware of the added pressure and discrimination other people face as well. 
Yeah. When we released our book into the world, we immediately got a scathing Amazon review from a woman who read our introduction where we acknowledge these things. We acknowledge that people with disabilities have it harder than people without disabilities when it comes to positive body image and body image resilience. That race plays into this, that background and class and sexuality, it all plays into the fact that where people meet at these intersections, it can make their lives more difficult. It makes gaining positive body image more difficult, especially in a world where people are discriminated against, where real harms are opposed on people because of their natural hair or their body size or their skin color, whatever the thing might be. And this woman just wrote just a truly scathing review that is still like the top review on Amazon, even though we have like hundreds of star reviews. That's this one that a bunch of conservative people took as kind of a dog whistle. They don't like the word privilege. And we used the fact that we do have privilege and recognizing our own privilege in this world as, you know, white, able-bodied, middle-class, educated women. You have to acknowledge your privilege in all this. And it's just, it's so important for people to start out acknowledging what they have, acknowledging their privilege, because, you know, in a world where a lot of us, a lot of people listening are not discriminated against in these real ways. They are not withheld jobs because they wear their natural hair. You know, they are able to fit into clothing in most stores they can walk into. That is real privilege. And when you can start there, it allows you to see that you can be an advocate for good in so many ways, in helping the world change for all people, so that all people, regardless of their body size, shape, appearance, or background, can be humanized, can be made to feel like more than a body. But we definitely have to start by acknowledging our privilege. And one important point on that, I think, is that that doesn't mean that people with privilege don't also feel terribly about their bodies. That privilege doesn't actually protect you from the body shame that we experience. That's actually just a completely standard part of living in an objectifying culture that values women's bodies at the expense of their full humanity. And so even if you are on the thinner side of things, even if you are white and fit a more traditional mold of beauty and have an able body and all that, that doesn't mean you're going to feel great about yourself. What it does mean is that, like Lexi said, you're probably not being actively discriminated against. There's probably not serious prejudice against you in ways that people that don't have all of that privilege are experiencing. But our work is for everybody. It recognizes that we're all at a disadvantage when we're focused on how we look. Regardless of how the world looks at us, we are already at that disadvantage because we are self-objectifying. We are holding ourselves back. And so this process becomes an individual one that then leads to a more collective response, a more collective revolution. I think that's what's so crucial about it is that it starts at home with each of us. It starts with retraining our own mindsets toward our own bodies. And then we turn that lens outward to other people, to who we interact with, who we listen to, who are the people in our news feeds and in the entertainment that we seek out. Do we value diversity of all kinds, including body diversity, and what we are exposing ourselves to. And that will help us to chip away at some of the bias that we feel in our own minds toward other people, because that absolutely exists. And it contributes to larger bias in the outside world. But this revolution starts individual and it becomes collective. It grows and grows as more women take that stand for themselves and then change their environments in even small ways to be more comfortable, to be more empowering and lead to more fulfillment as opposed to this turning inward that self-objectification pushes us toward. Yeah. And the self-objectification also, you know, you kind of mentioned this before, but it creates that internal separateness and competition. It's like, oh, well, if I'm looking at myself like this, that means I'm sizing myself up to someone else out there in the world based upon their body. And really what we're doing when we're doing that is we're we're giving our power away. We're giving our power away to the outside world based off of this outward appearance. We're needing validation for something that truthfully we can't really control as much as we try to control it. You know, our bodies are going to function the way it needs to function best for us. And that's going to look very different for everyone. And so even in through the lens of, you know, our work is in manifestation, if your level of self-worth in your body 
is predicated on what other people think of it. And if you fit into this small box that society deems as acceptable, you're giving a lot of your power away and it's going to be hard to feel a high level of self-worth. Oh, I love that. That is so profound. Yeah, you're completely right. In a world where women have gained power in so few ways still in 2021, you know, there are so many ways that women don't have equal access and power, equal voice. We can liberate each other and take our power back individually and then collectively when we live as more than bodies. And so it's up to each one of us to think about what that means for you. What does it mean to be more than a body? More than a body to be looked at and judged and fixed and compared and evaluated for eternity. How can that show up in your life? How can you show up even when those self-objectifying critical thoughts tell you, eh, I wouldn't go swimming today. Like I'd, I'd wait a few weeks and, and really get your workout on and then come back or cut out carbs for a while. You're, you're going to feel better when you get out there if you cut out carbs for a while. No, how can you show up today? How can you show up and take opportunities that come your way? You know, Lindsay had this, if I can, Lindsay <laughs> had this experience a couple days ago where she was like, I've got some bad acne. And I don't know if I want to go to this party in Central Park. And I said, Linz, it's fine. Everybody's sweaty. Everybody has flaws. Everybody has acne on a 90 degree day. Not everybody, but a lot of people. And you deserve to get out there and live anyway. And Lindsay gives me the same pep talk all the time. We have to do this for each other. But it is so much more fun to just get out there and be instead of live in these abstract anxieties that exist in our minds. When we get out of this prison, oh my gosh, there's so much more joy, so much more freedom and power. Yeah, a big part of our our angle on this is where do you get your power? What does empowerment look like and feel like? In the book, we go into kind of a, a critical review of the ways that empowerment has been framed for women in media and especially through body stuff. It's always from this angle of look good, feel good. And like, if you feel beautiful, you'll have all the confidence in the world. And it's really important to interrogate that because it's exactly what you're describing, where your power is something that is given to you, that is bestowed upon you by people who find you attractive. If it's romantic interest that you're after, or, you know, if your career and your validation revolves around the number of likes you get and the number of positive comments about your body or people who will engage with your posts because your body looks a certain way then all of that can be taken away as freely as it's given. You know, your body can change suddenly and it absolutely will change over time. And you may, you know, lose your job and not have the money for all of the products and procedures and whatever that you want to have or expected to have. When we are focused so much on how we look, then our power is given away. You're right. It is given to other people. And the best thing we can do is take it back by prioritizing how we live over how we look. It's not waiting until 10 or 100 pounds from now to be able to do the things that we want to do. It's a focus on what you want to experience as opposed to how the world experiences you. And so when you face that shame and the temptation is to hide or to fix and wait it out, instead, what we can do is in that moment, again, focus on what do you want to do? How do you want to feel? It's pushing back on these boundaries that our fear tells us are necessary for us to stay within. We have all this fear, and for a good reason, so many different messages in our culture, especially in media, our whole lives have taught us that it's embarrassing to be fatter than you want to be. It is shameful to not be as beautiful as you want to be and not look as young as you want to, and to have acne and cellulite and all of these other perfectly normal things that we've been taught to view as failures and flaws. And what we need to do is to test our limits push past those fears and see if you can prove them wrong. Because what I want you to know is that you can. When you actually go out there, put yourself out there for opportunities or relationships or experiences, then you find out that you can still do those things. You can still have those things and those feelings, even if you don't look the way you thought you needed to to qualify. Because all of that's a myth. And our fears are built around these myths of what you have to do to qualify as a woman to be desirable and happy and healthy and everything else. Test those fears, get out there, prioritize how you live over how you look, and then see what it really feels like to live as an instrument and not an ornament. 
it's really kind of pushing against our edge. You know, it's pushing against, oh, it's only been comfortable for me to engage with my body this way and hide and fix or do these things. Like it's only safe if I'm in control or stay within this weight range. If I were to go out of that, I would feel out of control. And it's like, no, it would just be new. It might feel uncomfortable. It might feel different. It might even be painful at first, but then you'll realize, oh, I can be in this body that wasn't exactly what I thought it needed to be. And I feel safe and I feel seen and I'm okay. Yes, it's you coming back home. Like it might feel uncomfortable because you haven't been home to yourself. You've been living in this world for everybody else, but coming back home, yeah, it's taking you out of the comfort zone that was actually incredibly uncomfortable. It's prioritizing you back to that first person perspective. And believe me, in the long run, it will be so much more comfortable, so much more happy, so much more powerful than you would be trying to live and exist for others viewing pleasure. It's time to come home. You guys have mentioned this before, but, you know, beauty is not a feeling. When people are like, I want to feel beautiful. No, you want to feel seen or you want to feel validated or you want to feel loved or you want to feel safe. You don't want to feel beautiful. What does beauty represent? And how can you feel that without the construct of beauty? Yes, absolutely. One thing that we also talk about along that same vein is that sexy is not a look. It's not an appearance. And women have been so isolated from their own sexual power and pleasure, their own sexuality, really, because we've been taught to perform it. We've been taught that it looks a certain way, not that it should feel a certain way. And we learn that from a lot of different sources. Of course, most pornography is made from the perspective of men and for men. And so women's pleasure and desires are totally in the backseat. It also is so shaped around how women's bodies look in those moments. And so in our own sexual lives, we hover outside of our bodies in those moments, imagining how we look, how he must be seeing me or how they must be perceiving me from the outside. And that limits, obviously, your pleasure. That limits your positive feelings you can possibly experience in that moment because we have objectified our sexuality so much. And so when you're able to redefine beauty and sex appeal as something that's for you as opposed to something that's for other people, you really take some of that power back. You can get back inside your own body because it's, again, there for your own use and your own experience and benefit not for anyone else's. Oh, that's so powerful because I think that's so true for so many people that their sexual experience is not for their own pleasure or that their own pleasure is tied to their own perception of themselves, which is tied to how other people may be perceiving them in that moment. Yes. Wow. What tips would you give parents? who are listening to this, who are like, oh my gosh, what do I tell my child? How do I navigate this? You just shared a story on Instagram of Lexi, your daughter saying, I have so much more to be and mom, you have so much more to be. I mean, that was such a tearjerker. <laughs> oh, it was so good. Yes, I'm I'm currently working on this experiment of how we teach kids. I, I have a five-year-old daughter, Logan, and an 18-month-old daughter, Lane. And a few of the things I do that and it's not just personal experience, this is backed up by research. One of the first things that is so deeply important is that, you know, outside of family and a few close friends, when kids are little, the ideas they get about bodies come from media. And in kids' media, it is so much more sexually objectifying and presents so much more narrow, unreal ideals than you could even imagine. Like, parents think that Disney is going to be safe, that animated cartoons are going to be safe for kids. And I would argue that they are deeply harmful for the most part. It makes your job as a parent a lot more difficult. But when you can critically view what your kids are watching and look at the fact that female protagonists almost always look the same, they have big eyes and tiny noses and tiny chins and big breasts and big hips and tiny waists. They are usually always white. They fit these very, very unrealistic, unattainable ideals that were sold our entire lives. But little kids, they pick this stuff up. 
So the way to do this, depending on the age of your child and you know them best, is to start helping them ask really critical questions of what they're watching and how it feels to see what they're seeing. So with Logan, I mean, I am very strict about what she views. If she's watching something and, you know, the other day she was watching Ralph Breaks the Internet, like the second one, and every single female character in that is shaped that exact same way that I just described. Every single freaking one. And men are shaped like potatoes. They're shaped, (laughs) they're black, they're white, they're dogs, they're everything you can imagine. Men and boys in kids' media, and really in all media, just get to be. They are valued for who they are. The girls are always other. They are always the other. You know that on Baby Shark, the original Baby Shark is a boy. And then all the other sharks that come in when they are girls, they are decorated to show that they are girls because girls exist to be looked at. So they have bows and pearls and makeup. Girls always have eyelashes in kids' media. Oh, I could I could go off on this forever. So it's important to be really critical with your kids about, huh, why do you think all the girls always look the same and the boys get to look lots of different ways? Let's think about the girls and the women we know in real life. Do they look like that? How does that make you feel to only see girls that look like this? Maybe we need to get more creative because these media creators are not very creative when it comes to girls. Let's draw some characters and create some people that look like more creative, that look like girls you see in real life or the kind of girls you want to see that look nothing like real life. Help them realize that they are not just passive consumers, but that they can be creators of a new world. It will be so entirely helpful for them their whole lives. So powerful. I am so excited for future generations. That is just amazing. Also, we have this term based off of the title of the podcast, expanders, and it's really finding people that you resonate with who are embodying an aspect that you want to bring out more of yourself in, or, you know, let's say they have the job you desire, you see to believe it's possible because they have it. And so I think that really, really applies to body image resilience, having a variety of bodies, shapes, sizes, colors in your eyesight and curating that. You know, you guys talk a lot about in the book, but ways to curate your social media. I even started, I made a Pinterest board called Body Expanders, and it's all different women, all different shapes and sizes in bikinis specifically, just so I can see, okay, like this is what that stomach looks like in that one. And this is all normal and great and amazing. And I'm just a one of the bodies in here. And that's cool. Like this is what it all looks like. Start curating all of these different pieces of media for yourself instead of that feed and that loop that just sends you the same images again and again and again that are so harmful. Yeah, exactly. It's important to normalize all types of diversity in your life, including normalizing seeing women that are being valued for more than just how they look. Like it's a really important first step to normalize what bodies might look like. And then from there, as grown women, one thing that we actually have to work hard to do is to fill our feeds and our media environments with examples of women who are valued for so much more than that. Women who are doing and being and living as opposed to just, hey, I like how she looks because she looks like me or because she represents something that I want to be. So much of our media lives can be filled with those types of examples. And so it's important for us to really consciously and actively push back on that so we remember to value ourselves and everybody else for so much more than how they look. So helpful. So now I'll make another board of women that I'm just (laughs) evaluating outside. Yes, exactly. I'm expanding my expander boards. (laughs) (laughs) I love that. I just want to end on this one quote from the book because I think it's so, so impactful. And just to put everything in context of, you know, this conversation, body image is the final frontier for too many women, the last and most stubborn barrier to our own confidence, fulfillment, power, and self-actualization. We can be empowered and emboldened and confident and successful in every other aspect of our lives and yet still struggle with deep-seated body shame and self-objectification, to which we sacrifice incredible amounts of time, money, emotion, and energy. Oh my gosh. Knowing that there are so many badass people out there in the world 
and doing such incredible things and that they might be having that body shame or having that self-objectification, you know, how can we start to shift our brain, shift our mind and release the pressure to focus on the body? We need to get uncomfortable with the discomfort. We have been silent and uncomfortable and ashamed for way too long. There are so many women in this world who are incredibly successful in so many different areas and happy in so many areas of their lives. And yet overwhelmingly, women still feel terribly about their bodies. And what we need to do is to stop making that normal, to stop bonding over it, stop making body shame an unquestioned aspect of the female experience. It is not. It has not always been. It is not in every culture. It is not an innate part of us to hate our bodies and to constantly be at war with them and trying to fix them as our projects through our whole lives. That's learned behavior in an economy that banks on our insecurity to sell us products and services for the rest of our lives because we'll never fully reach those ideals. And in turn, we'll never fully reach the happiness and desirability and help that's promised to us for meeting those ideals. It's an illusion. And so what we need to do for every woman out there who has dealt with that body shame, who has held herself back in some way because she doesn't like how she looks, get mad about that. Feel the pain, like really allow yourself to feel the pain, the regret, the disappointment and discouragement that you've experienced throughout your life. You can mourn that. You can allow space for that kind of pain and disappointment and regret. But from that point on, that's when you need to recognize those feelings as they come up. And in that process, in that exact moment, when you feel that shame that's trying to convince you to go on that diet or to get that surgery or whatever else, or even to cut yourself, in that moment, that's when you make the conscious choice to practice building your body image resilience. You're going to get back inside your own body. Feel that compassion for yourself. Imagine your little girl self free from that self-consciousness and talk to yourself as if you were her. And then you will work on all of the strategies that are required to focus on how you're living instead of how you're looking. And it will get easier every single day. This process is cumulative. You build your body image resilience to the point where those disruptions, even when they get bigger and harder, your response in a resilient way will become so much more natural to you. That's where we want to get to. The ability to feel comfortable in this environment that has trained us to be uncomfortable. We're no longer going to be comfortable with objectification. We're no longer going to be comfortable and cool and calm with hating our bodies. This is the revolution we need. Uh, mic drop. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. Thank you, Lindsay. Thank you, Lexi, so much. This was so incredible and powerful and such a beautiful call in. Anyone who this resonates with deeply, share this, tell people about it, start your own inner excavation by the book. Tell us more about the book and where we can find that as well. So our debut book, More Than a Body, Your Body is an Instrument, Not an Ornament, is available worldwide in English, everywhere books are sold. It's available on Kindle and audiobook as well. We got to narrate it ourselves, which was really fun. A lot of people have been buying the audiobook so they can listen to it with other people around and then the hardcover so they can take notes. And of course, we love that very much. You can find more about us and our work at morethanabody.org, on Instagram at beauty underscore redefined, on Facebook at beauty redefined. We would love to connect with you. Thank you. And we'll have all of this linked in the show notes for you guys too. highly recommend the book. There's so much insight and expertise and also exercises and critical thinking and questions and tools and practical steps. So, so, so helpful. Definitely recommend that as well. All right. Thank you guys so much. And we'll see you next time. Awesome. Thank you, Jessica. Bye. Thank you so much for tuning into the episode, and I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did, we did. And in case you're not totally ready to join the pathway yet, I wanted to share a few of our free offerings that I'll often suggest to people as a little bit of a blueprint to get them started on their manifestation journey. The first place I like to direct people completely for free is the motivation. 
You can see it linked below or on our homepage as our testimony library. And it's categorized by different subjects, whether you're calling in career, money, love, wellness, and much more. When you're reading about a member's experience of what they manifested, you're actually seeing to believe and showing your subconscious that that very thing is possible for you. The second place I like to direct people is to the free clarity exercise, which is also linked below. In it, you get to try our own unique hypnosis process, learn about the science and some journaling prompts. And the best part about this, you'll get a tiny taste of what it's like to go into your hypnotic state, bring your subconscious forward and create new neural pathways while receiving clarity. And the third thing, if you haven't listened to it on this podcast yet, please go back to the episode titled Manifestation 101, where you'll learn the basics of neural manifestation to truly understand this process. So go ahead and check out those free resources, the motivation, the free clarity exercise, and the episode Manifestation 101, all linked below. And in an effort to make sure to have representation in this process series, go ahead and submit any process testimonials you have, especially to our LGBTQ plus community, our BIPOC, as well as the Ys, which is anyone in the community who is 45 and over. All right, we'll be back next week. <laughs>